Hello, welcome to the Legatum Institute. I'm Peter Pomerantsev. I run our project Beyond Propaganda, part of our broader transitions forum. Uh, it's a project that looks at uh, innovations in propaganda, and today we'll be talking about this very common term that we've uh, grown used to hearing recently, information war. Uh, what is it? Does it really exist? Um, and if it does exist, how should one combat it? How do various countries approach it? Uh, with me, I have Mark Laity, who's the, and I'm going to try to get this right because it's a long title, uh, the Head of Strategic Communications for the Military Part of NATO. Correct. Very grand. Uh, Laura Jackson, who is um, uh, Director of Research on various uh, highly impressive um, research projects for the US Department of Defense on US-China relations. And Ben Nimmo, who is an analyst of information war across the world. Information war, um, what on earth do, let's say, what do the Russians mean when they say information war? Do they mean what we mean by information war? Um, they probably, yes. The term that they actually prefer to use is information confrontation. Um, and I think that's very indicative of what they mean by it. If you look at their most recent open source writings, they talk about the information conflict, the information confrontation running from the very beginning of any conflict, which is the covert place, up through the crisis, into the conflict, and then afterwards. So they regard information confrontation as something that is happening in peace, in war, it's a grey zone as far as they're concerned, and from the point at which we don't think war is. So they have five phases, and it's in every single phase. And I think in that sense, information confrontation is a cradle to grave, very broad thing for them. And that's not how we see it. It's not how we, certainly not how we do it, where we have a fairly black and white staging between peace and war. So it's a permanent war. It sounds a bit like sort of, you know, Trotsky's or Marxist ideas of sort of permanent, uh, permanent revolution. Um, but what exactly is information war? Is it, you know, um, you know, when I hear information war, I think propagandist from one side, uh, shouting at propagandist from the other side, and trying to convince each other who's right. You know, capitalism is better than communism. No, communism is better than capitalism. Is that what they mean? Is it a, a battle of ideas? No, no. I mean, it's, it is information confrontations about getting what they want. So in that sense, to use a military phase, it's effects-based. What is the effect they are trying to achieve? If they want to gain some territory or persuade a nation or gain an ally, then they will use information to achieve it. And they will also use other effects. Um, the common phrase which is used in the West is dime, diplomatic, information, military, and econ econ uh, economics. They're looking at this whole way of, of achieving what they want to achieve. So as far as they're concerned, the military effect, the economic effect, the informational effect, they're all part of achieving what they want to. So this could mean, for instance, taking Crimea, in which information was terribly important, taking eastern Ukraine, in which they are obviously still trying, but it could also mean influencing the rest of Europe to let them take eastern Ukraine and Crimea. They are waging an information confrontation against, in effect, the whole of NATO and its partner nations to let us, make us, accept what they have done and persuade us that it's okay, and perhaps beyond that, to maybe get other nations to leave NATO. That's what they mean. It's everything. Uh, Laura, we've heard, we hear a lot about Russia and Chinese war. Um, we hear a lot about Russia and this information. But um, I was quite surprised when I started reading some of your research uh, that the Chinese have a strikingly similar theory and approach. Yes, that's right. They do have something extremely similar, drawing on the themes that Mark was mentioning about how it's very pre-kinetic. Um, and in 2003, they actually adopted something called the Three Warfares, which is sort of a disinformation information strategy, which has three parts. Essentially, you have the media warfare, where you're trying to constantly um, condition public opinion. So you have all your news articles. So you have the Chinese Communist Party mouth papers and their newspapers constantly uh, channeling state propaganda. You have psychological warfare, so they're trying to um, disrupt an opponent's decision-making capability. So, for example, that could be by anything such as um, 
putting sanctions, put, um, restricting imports of bananas like they did with the Philippines in the Scarborough Shoal standoff in 2012, um, to threatening to sell US debt. So anything on the full spectrum of psychological warfare. And then also they have legal warfare. So that is basically exploiting legal systems, customs, uh, conventions, particularly the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, uh, to have a, a, a certain effect. And they're doing this across a, a broad range of issue areas, but most notably in the South China Sea. Um, where they're, they're, they've got complete, competing claims, they're targeting multiple audiences, so the US, their own domestic population, uh, they want to target the claimants, so Vietnam, uh, Malaysia, um, even Japan, um, and then the international community as well. So they're using all of these different, this, this tripartite policy process that's been approved at the highest level, so by the Communist Party and the Central Military Commission, which is the supreme leading organ of the armed forces, to really drive home the effects of this, um, of this information warfare campaign. Can you give me one example of the information warfare in action? I mean, you mentioned the Philippines or Japan, or how, how is the, how, you know, paint us a picture of how it works. Okay, so if I take lawfare, which is probably legal warfare, which is probably the most um, the most obvious thing that they that they're doing to date. So, for example, they there's um, what they're doing in the South China Sea is their particular islands or particular submerged rocks that they're dredging the seabed, putting all of the sand on top of this island, um, and then claiming creating an artificial island and what's essentially a reef then claiming that within international law that generates two things. So a territorial sea, which gives them 12 nautical miles, and an ec exclusive economic zone of um, 200 nautical miles. Um, so they're using legal war, they're using um, the international law to be able to establish legal spheres, uh, but they're also um, sort of d blurring the distinction about what, what actually is an island. And then they're also challenging the legal definitions. So, for example, in an exclu exclusive economic zone, um, you do have exclusive rights to the economic activity within that zone. But China is trying to push that legal definition to say that they can um, essentially uh, say what foreign navies can do within that exclusive economic zone. So saying that they can't sail within that 200 nautical mile limit without getting prior approval, which is not um, established in UNCLOS, to which they're signatory. Ben, what are we going to... Well, actually, two questions, and maybe you can do them uh, in, in one bit. Um, how is this so different from what, from what the West do? And what should democracies or NATO be doing in order to get to grips with this sort of, uh, sort of subtle undermining of reality that both Russia and China are, are attempting? Uh, in essence, the difference between what they do and what the West do is that they're doing it and all the time, and the West isn't. I mean, as, as Mark was saying, the West has a fairly black and white, in wartime we conduct information warfare, and in peacetime we don't. And, and it's the same with the Chinese. It's, it's an ongoing process all the time. So there is a, a consistent and concerted push on information and an attempt to confuse and distort and distract all the time, peacetime, wartime, it doesn't matter, it's going on all the while. And this is something very difficult for the West to come to terms with. We've got used to the idea of there are certain conventions even in warfare, for example, the fact that you declare war. And this is not a declared war, but it's going on nonetheless. So, so for the West, it's quite hard to get the idea that we're not fighting a war against Russia, but there is information warfare coming at us. So what do we do? So what, what we do is we, we need to grasp the fact that, particularly in the information age, if you try and wait for the disinformation to come out and then counter it, you're too late. And a good example would be when Putin stood up and, on the, the 18th of March and said, we annexed Crimea because otherwise Sevastopol would have been a NATO military base. Within 20 minutes, that was being reported in Auckland, and Wellington, and Sydney, and Singapore. You, know, you read the Straits Times, you read the Australian, and that lie went round the world in 20 minutes. There is no way you can catch up the lie that fast, but what you can do is build up people's information beforehand. You, you can't counter disinformation with information. You can only, with, with disinformation, you can only counter it with information. And the classic example would be, if I give you a cup of tea and you've never drunk, drunk tea before, and I tell you, it's really lovely, it tastes of raspberries, you might well think, OK, it doesn't look like raspberries, but it tastes like that. If you've already drunk tea before, you think tea doesn't taste like raspberries, it tastes like tea. You have pre-existing information, which means that you can tell when you're being disinformed. And in the same way, if there are concerns about 
a particular area, let's say, of Europe, where people start thinking, hang on, there, there's something very dodgy going on there. We might be getting little green men popping up in six weeks' time. What you need to do is start taking satellite photos of it straight away. You need to start sending journalists and think tankers and NGOs there straight away. So that, and, and they need to start reporting back home. This is what we are seeing on the ground right now before the disinformation comes, so that when the little green men pop up and the story is these are local separatists, there's already a body of information and knowledge in the West which says, yeah, but we were there last week. There wasn't an indigenous separatist movement then, so either this territory has gone separatist in a week, or it's actually the Russian special forces in disguise pretending to be separatists, which is what we've had. So, so it, once you accept that disinformation is the problem, then your solution is information, but if you wait, it's too late. So, so there has to be a predictive quality to it. And to, the, to, to some extent, you, know, you need intelligence to say, OK, where do we think the problem is likely to happen? But once you've identified the trouble spot, you know, it might be the, the South China Sea, it might be the Malacca Straits, it might be the Baltic States. You know, it can depend on the issue. It could be the Turkish border. You get as much information as publicly available as possible in as many formats as possible, TV, print, radio, satellite imagery, and you, and you push it out there into public source and you archive it and then you have a track record and as soon as something happens there you can say yeah but we've got all this information beforehand which says that's not true, that can't be true. Would you be really annoyed if I call that a preemptive doctrine? Uh, that's exactly right, you, ne you need preemptive information. Okay, that's not the other preemptive doctrine. Okay, good. No. Preemptive information doctrine is something quite different. Yes. Okay, well thank you very much for joining us um, and hopefully that's illuminated your understanding of information war um, which really isn't like the way it's described uh, commonly. Uh, it's actually a, a military doctrine and thus has to be thought about in a much more strategic way.